So Connor Ben's back at it again, all over the news, protesting his innocence. Now he's got a couple of experts by his side backing him up, presenting what they claim is ironclad evidence. And I'll come on to the specifics of that a little bit later on. I think it's good for the public to hear some of this evidence, but you have to understand that these experts, to the best of my knowledge, are people that Connor Ben has paid to defend him. It's similar to a court case where the defense team go out and look for a scientist or a doctor who's willing and able to present a plausible argument that the prosecution's evidence is unreliable. Sometimes they'll get rejected by several people who say, you know what, the DNA and the forensics are just too strong. Sorry, I can't help you. But they'll just keep looking until they eventually find someone who says, yep, I can make a case for you. And by the way, this is my fee. <laughs> I remember Richard Dwyer, who is a practicing lawyer, making a comment about this once. To paraphrase him, he said, you can find an expert to go up in court and make a case for just about anything if you pay him enough money. At the end of the day, he's just expressing a professional opinion. The prosecution then produce their own expert to counter that opinion. It's then up to the jury under the direction of the judge to decide who they believe. In this Connor Ben case, a similar process is going on behind the scenes with UCAD. But we're only hearing from the defense team. We haven't heard what the prosecution or the judge have to say, figuratively speaking. So the question is, with the investigation ongoing, if Ben's evidence is so compelling, why doesn't he just wait for the verdict? Why does he suddenly feel the need to present his evidence in the media? As far as I can see, there are only two possible explanations. Either he genuinely doesn't trust UCAD and he fears they might stitch him up so he wants to let the world see how ironclad his defense is, or his evidence isn't as strong as he's been making out. And this move is just a PR exercise to get the public on his side for the purposes of putting pressure on UCAD to find him innocent, or in the event that he's found guilty, to convince people that there's been a miscarriage of justice. That could then be used to justify fighting Chris Eubank Jr. or whoever else in the Middle East. Well, first of all, this notion that UCAD might have it in for him because of their association with the British Boxing Board of Control. I've seen no evidence for that. The circumstances of Conor Ben's two failed tests were different to Dylan White's failed tests in the run-up to the Oscar Rivas fight, for example, because White failed a UCAD test. UCAD not only do all the testing for the British board, but they also carry out investigations for them and issue suspensions. So they were able to act on the Dylan White case immediately. But Connor Ben, on the other hand, failed two VADA tests. And VADA is just a testing agency. They don't investigate anything and they don't issue suspensions. So the board wanted Connor Ben's team to hand their evidence over to UCAD so they could investigate, but they refused. The board then, understandably, felt very uncomfortable allowing the fight to go ahead under those circumstances. But they had no legal means to suspend Ben or force him to immediately cooperate. So they had to consult with their legal team and find another way within their rules to withdraw sanctioning of the bout, which they eventually managed to do. I never saw any hint of their actions being motivated by a grudge against Conor Ben, but I saw plenty of evidence of Ben being belligerent and uncooperative right from the very beginning. And Eddie Hearn was just as bad, by the way. You had a pair of entitled silver spoon kids throwing their toys out the pram because the board refused to bow to their will. Ben then gave up his license and vowed never to deal with the board ever again. And he and Eddie Hearn explored numerous alternate avenues, such as fighting in America, fighting in the Middle East, and so on, none of which have come to fruition so far. We heard that due to numerous foreign commissions having a good rapport with the British board, they might deny Ben a license in solidarity with them. Ben then directed his team of hired experts to compile a dossier of evidence to present to the WBC for the purposes of being reinstated in their rankings and to try and bolster his attempts to get licensed again. Ben, once again, displayed entitled arrogance, publicly pressuring the WBC to hurry up and exonerate him. The bulk of his dossier was purported to show evidence of sloppy testing procedures in VADA labs, hinting at sample contamination. Conor Ben claimed to believe that he did not have clomiphene in his system at any time. However, when the WBC's verdict eventually came down, they said nothing about lab contamination. They concluded that Ben did have 
clomiphene in his system, but it probably got there through consumption of contaminated eggs, and therefore he should be exonerated. But there's two problems with that. Number one, it's illegal to give clomiphene to chickens in the UK. Some farmers do so illegally, but you'd have to prove that you ate eggs from one of those farms and consumed enough of them to produce a positive test. You'd need a trail of evidence. And number two, Connor Ben vehemently refuted the notion that he'd eaten contaminated eggs. His hired experts concluded that it was lab contamination that produced a positive test. But of course, there's a problem with that as well, because Ben failed two tests several weeks apart. Are we to believe that both samples were contaminated with the exact same substance on separate occasions? Eubank was tested by Vada as well. How come his samples never contained clomiphene? Why was it only Ben's? And this brings us on to Connor Ben's latest evidence, because he has assembled a brand new team of experts, and they are now claiming that it actually was contaminated eggs after all. <laughs> I guess they decided the lab contamination argument wasn't convincing enough. They're saying that Ben has some type of unusual physiology whereby his body stores clomiphene much longer than a normal person, which allows it to build up. I'm assuming this is to try and get around the fact that it's illegal to give clomiphene to British chickens, so eating contaminated eggs in Britain is unlikely. Therefore, perhaps, they're trying to argue that Ben may have eaten some contaminated eggs when he was on vacation somewhere, many months prior, and due to this unique physiology he has, it stayed in his system long enough to produce a positive test result many, many, many months later. I mean, let's just hope UCAD aren't intimidated by any public pressure. Let's hope they examine the evidence dispassionately and deliver a fair verdict, whether it's guilty or innocent. I'll leave it there. Let me know what you guys think. Are you sick and tired of the mainstream mindset? Does the dogmatic conformity and pathological ignorance have you tearing your hair out in frustration? Then don't be alone. Come and join our brotherhood on Patreon. We stand as a beacon of reason against an army of insanity. You'll gain access to my weekly topical podcast where we take more deep dives than Jacques Cousteau on an endless variety of subjects. There's also videos, interviews, live Q&As, as well as a vast back catalog of previous episodes, including my popular Confessions of a Nightclub Bouncer series. You can listen via the Patreon app or download in high quality MP3. Connect with myself and hundreds of other members in our Element chat group. There's no contract, no commitment, you can cancel at any time, and it's cheaper than a Mickey D's McMuffin. Just head to my Patreon page via the link below this video and select the tier called The Brotherhood of Reason. I'll see you over there.